seminar. So as you must know by now, um, on Tuesday evening, on the 29th of uh, April, we're having, we're kicking off a major conference called Understanding the Challenge of Iran. So it'll be the 29th of April in Manhattan at the Yale Club. And then the 30th all day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. we're having the conference here, actually in this room, in room 101. Um, and there'll be scholars from, from the Middle East, from Iran, from Israel, from Europe, and North America, and some of the leading scholars on issues of human rights in Iranian society, and some of the geopolitical issues that Iran is uh, posing to the region and to the international community. So I, I would urge you to come. After the conference will end at about 5 o'clock, and then the same evening at about 8 o'clock in uh, Yale College, we're, we're honored to be able to uh, host Shaul Mufaz is the Deputy Prime Minister of Israel, and he'll be here speaking also, uh, coincidentally, about issues of Iran. And it's also connected to the next day is Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Memorial Day, so the issues are sort of, at some level, I suspect, unfortunately, connected. So I think Mufaz will be speaking about that. So I hope you can attend, and I hope you can tell people about it. So today is the last seminar of the semester. And it's really a pleasure to be able to host Ronnie Stauber. Uh, Professor Stauber will speak, will speak today about the academic and public debate over the meaning of the new anti-Semitism. Uh, Ronnie is currently the director on sabbatical of the Stephen Roth Institute at Tel Aviv uh, University. The Stephen Roth Institute is, the, I guess, one of four international uh, centers dealing with contemporary issues of anti-Semitism and racism. Um, He's also a senior research fellow at the Institute. He's a professor of, in the Department of Jewish History at Tel Aviv University. And he writes uh, prolifically on issues of anti-Semitism and also the Holocaust. Um, he's written a book, for example, uh, entitled The Holocaust in Israeli Public Debates during the 1950s, Ideology and Memories and Lessons for This Generation. He's also written with Oxford University Press a book entitled Confronting the Jewish Response During the Holocaust, Yad Vashem, a commemorative and research institute in the 1950s. And he's written many articles and papers and he's quoted widely in the media. And I think, just on a personal note, he was actually one of the first uh, scholars and we had the idea of creating ISGAP and the Yale Initiative. He was one of the first scholars I uh, spoke to at Tel Aviv University telling him about the idea and he was very encouraging, so it's actually nice that uh, he's here to give a paper with us today. So, Rami. Okay, good evening. Um, so first of all, thank you, Professor Small Charles, for this uh, kind invitation, this opportunity, wonderful opportunity to come here today and to present my paper. Actually, I wanted to tell this about this meeting at Tel Aviv University, our first meeting that um, we told it already. Um, and let me just uh, mention that we are cooperating already with two institutes in publishing the uh, Yerkut Moreshet for the study of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. And um, we do hope for really further cooperations between the center, between Tel Aviv University and the center at Yale University. Um, well, at the end of uh, 2000, the number of uh, violent and vandalism incidents rose almost steadily, reaching, as you can see, a peak in 2006. All about 590 cases of violence and vandalism were registered uh, worldwide in 2006. And there was also a considerable increase in the verbal insults and threats directed against uh, Jews, as well as the publication of anti-Semitic articles. In a comparison to the uh, 90s, and here you can see the comparison between 2006 and 1999, there was an increase of hundreds 
a percent in the number of anti-Semitic incidents. In 1999, there were 150 incidents, and more than 50% of them were cases of vandalism and desecration of cemeteries and memorials. And at that time, only 20% were violence against Jewish individuals. This trend has changed dramatically in the following year, in 2000. In 2000, we had already about 250 incidents. In 2002, more than 300. In 2004, our institute, the Stephen Roth Institute, gathered information on more than 500 incidents of violence and vandalism. And now, about 40% of them, in comparison only to 20% in 1999, were violent incidents against Jewish individuals. So not only against, not only vandalism of cemeteries, but now mainly against street violence, against Jewish individuals. This significant shift in the targets of the anti-Semitic incidents is a very important indication of the increasing involvement of young Muslims in the violence against Jews in Europe, a topic that I'll discuss later in my lecture. Now, this dramatic increase in the incident targeted Jewish individuals and Jewish property was accompanied by a fascinating debate regarding the significance of these events to the Jews worldwide, in which researchers, intellectuals, writers, and public figures participated. They have debated over several fundamental questions which resulted from different and even contrasting interpretations of the events. The polemic extended far beyond anti-Semitism per se to basic questions regarding the life of the Jews today in the diaspora, their relationship with different segments of the surrounding society, particularly in Europe, where most of the anti-Semitic incidents occurred, the relationship and the commitment of Jewish living all over the world to Israel, and the commitment of Israel to the safety and the prosperity of the Jewish communities in the diaspora. Since the beginning of this debate, dozens of articles as well as few collections of articles, books, have been written on this issue. And it is, of course, impossible to discuss here the numerous views and all the aspects of this fascinating intellectual debate. And therefore, my aim in this lecture is to discuss some of the more fundamental disagreements that were revealed during this polemic. In his article, Sense uh, on Antisemitism, published in the British monthly magazine, Prospect Magazine, in August 2002, Anthony Lehrman, the executive director of the Institute of the Jewish Policy Research and a well-known dissenter of the view that the Jews have faced new trend of anti-Semitism, wrote that this argument about new anti-Semitism began with the outbreak of the Al-Aqsa Al Intifada on October 2000. This claim is incorrect. Although it is true that, that this term, new anti-Semitism, became common in the public discourse only after the outbreak of the Second Intifada, by the end of 2000, the warning that the Jews worldwide are facing new form of hate can be traced back to the beginning of the 90s. In 1994, 
Martin Kramer, a Middle East researcher from Tel Aviv University, wrote an article in commentary called Jihad Against the Jews. Kramer observed a dramatic shift in the thinking of many Muslim fundamentalists regarding the Jews. A new concept of worldwide war, jihad, against the Jews. Kramer's prediction was very pessimistic, but eventually accurate. And I quote from 1994. This anti-Semitism, he wrote, seems to me a widespread and potentially violent that it could eclipse all other forms of anti-Semitism over the next decade. In the same year, Kremer gave a lecture at a conference that was hosted by the JPR, and one of the chief organizers was Tony Lerman. And in this conference, Kremer emphasized that the idea of Jewish worldwide plot to undermine and to destroy Islam, this is 1994, had occupied already a central role in the worldwide of Islamic fundamentalism. And there are clear signs that it's about to become a cornerstone in their ideology. Kremer noted that now, particularly in the wake of the bombing of the uh, Jewish community building in Buenos Aires, the Amia building, this was in July 1994, there should be no doubt anymore as to where the most serious threat to Jewish security lies. And he meant, of course, to the Islamic fundamentalism. He said that hard evidence is rapidly replacing speculation. It is evidence and that we cannot, ignore, not, we, can, we cannot ignore or deny. And actually, in retrospect to the 90s, I can say from my own experience, as one who began monitoring anti-Semitism very closely from the beginning of the 90s, that Kremer's assessment regarding the emerging of new form of anti-Semitism and its threats was not widely discussed in the 90s. At the beginning of the 90s, particularly after the collapse of the communist regime in Eastern Europe, anti-Semitism was identified almost entirely with the extreme right or with new formations that were created in the former communist countries, comprised of extreme right activists and communists, the so-called the Brown-Red Coalition. There were in the 90s clear signs, not only regarding the potential threats of terror of extreme Muslims, but also regarding the, the, regarding the growing role of young Muslims and Arabs, second and third generation of families of immigrants. And we were also aware that anti-Semitic motifs are part of the ideology of Muslim fundamentalism. For example, Dr. Esther Webman from our institute wrote a pioneering study on anti-Semitic motifs in the ideology of the Hezbollah and the Hamas and this was already in 1993. Following the deportation of, if you remember, the deportation of the Hamas leaders to Lebanon, this was 1993. And again in 1994, following the Baruch Goldstein massacre in Hebron, we witnessed and reported on a considerable increase in the violence against Jews in Europe. In July 1994, Iran agents, in collaboration with the Hezbollah and probably with the help of local collaborators, blow up, as I mentioned, the Amia Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires, killing 85 people. 
And between 1994 and 1996, we also monitored the activity of JIA, the Algerian uh, Islamic fanatic group, which in 1995 carried out a terrorist attack on Jewish school in Lyon, attempting to blow up uh, the Jewish school. Throughout the 90s, Islamist leaders in Europe preached and disseminated anti-Semitic messages, and Bin Laden waged his so-called holy war against the Crusaders and the Jews. However, reading our reports and others in the 90s reveals that the emphasis was still on the old perpetrators, the extreme right. And indeed, it is always difficult to identify new trend, to understand its various manifestations and the linkage between them. Are they all joined together into one coherent picture? Or maybe the attempt to present one picture, one explanation is artificial? And in fact, we are dealing with different phenomena that need different explanations. The late historian of anti-Semitism and the Third Reich, Uriel Tal, showed that at the end of the 19th century, prominent Jewish leaders in Germany as well found it hard to understand the essential difference between the traditional Christian Jewish hatred and the racial anti-Semitism. In fact, those leaders of the German jury, they ask the same basic questions that Jewish scholars and intellectuals ask today. Is it a new manifestation of the same old hatred or remnants of the old hatred? Or is it really a new phenomenon distinguished from the old one? And what does it mean to the Jewish people? Jacob Katz, the well-known Jewish scholar, called the decade a preceded the eruption of the racial and the political anti-Semitism in the 70s and the 80s of the 19th century, the incubation period. So perhaps this is also the right way to see the last decade, the 90s, of the 20th century. New concepts and perceptions developed gradually towards the eruption at the beginning of the next decade. And although the signs were seen before, the magnitude of the eruption came as a surprise to almost everyone. This difficulty to assess if we are dealing with new phenomena stemmed from the simple fact that any new phenomenon always contains, of course, previous elements. Eli Carmon, an expert in the field of international terrorism, particularly the Islamic and the Palestinian, pointed out that Jewish sites were targets of terror attacks of the radical left and the Palestinian terror groups since the end of the 60s. Although anti-Semitism was quite common among members of the French and the German extreme left, striking Jewish target in Europe at that time, the 60s and the 70s, was based on the concept that terror against the Jews is part of the war against Israel. Since the aim of the terror against Israel was to, uh, to uh, intensify the sense of insecurity among the Israelis, the Palestinians thought that any strike against Jewish targets will indeed intensify this feeling 
The Jews cannot live, cannot be safe worldwide until the Palestinian problem will be solved. Thus, Carmon sees the Islam terror attacks against Jewish targets as a continuation and intensification of the Palestinian and the extreme left terror of the 60s and the 70s. The Islamists even targeted the same sites that were attacked before. For example, in September 1986, Palestinian terror from Abu Nidal group attacked the Neve Shalom synagogue in Istanbul and killed 22 Jews. 70 years later, on November 2003, the same synagogue was attacked this time by the Turkish Islamists linked to Al-Qaeda. And then, in 2003, 23 people were killed, among them six Jews, and 330 people were injured. Nevertheless, it seems that even Kormon, who emphasized the collaboration between the Palestinian secular terror groups and the European radical left, accepts Kremer's basic claim regarding the transformation from a secular Palestinian concept that terror against the Jews is part of the war against Israel to a new concept to the current concept, Islamist concept, that claims that the conflict, or sees the conflict, in term, now in terms of struggle between Islam and the Jews, with a new vision of Jews and Israel as a supreme enemy and an existential threat to Islam. Following the eruption of the violence against Jewish targets in Europe with the beginning of the Second Intifada on October 2000, and then in 2001, the UN World Conference Against Racism at Durban, which became a milestone in the de demonization of Israel, including the use of classic anti-Semitic motifs, and the destruction of the World Trade Center in New York exactly at the same month. Following all those events, historians whose expertise was not Orientalism or Islam, but rather National Socialism, Holocaust, and modern anti-Semitism, notably Yehuda Bauer and Robert Wistrich, began to discuss the threat of Islamic fundamentalism. It is clear that when they both recognized what they view as an existential threat to the Jewish people, they spent time and efforts to learn this new field. And they both pointed out that like the two secular totalitarian ideologies who caused to the death of tens of millions of people, namely National Socialism and Communism, radical Islam as well desires for global domination, which it aimed to achieve by using violent means. According to this analysis, the new threat to the Jewish people is incomparable with any kind of anti-Semitic manifestations since the end of the war. It resembles only the Nazi anti-Semitism of a total war against the Jews, namely genocidal anti-Semitism. Indeed, as shown by Carmon, since 2000, there were several attempts and terror attacks against Jewish targets committed by members of Islamist 
groups, some of whom uh, connected or were inspired by Al-Qaeda, such as the attack on the Veshalom in Beth Israel synagogues in Istanbul that I mentioned, the attack on the historic synagogue in Jerba, Tunisia, in 2002, plans to attack Jewish targets in Germany and Norway, etc. However, what really characterized the new wave of anti-Semitism since 2000 was not an increase in the number of terror incidents, like large-scale acts of violence organized by groups that sought to hurt as many Jews as possible, but rather attacks on individual Jews by persons acting spontaneously, even without using violent means. Street violence in Europe. Anti-Semitic slogans were shouted during these street attacks. The fact that most incidents were perpetrated randomly is, in my opinion, a significant finding and I'll come back to it in my conclusions. With this dramatic rise in the street violence, an important question was raised regarding the identification of the perpetrators. Because the identification of the perpetrators is an essential element in the effort to analyze the reasons for this upsurge in anti-Semitism. Although the number of cases in which the police succeeded in establishing the identification of the perpetrators of physical attacks has always been significantly small, the involvement of Arabs and Muslims, according to the victims' testimonies, has been significant. But the question is, is there a clear connection between these numerous incidents perpetrated against Jewish individuals or Jewish property in Europe, and the campaign waged by the radical Islam against the Jews. It seems that both Bauer and Wistrich, they both see a clear connection. And this position has been supported by Jewish leaders as well. A. Foxman, for example, write unequivocally in his book, Never Again, that the message of hate preached in the Middle East in Middle Eastern mosques and broadcast electronically around the world, influencing Muslim immigrants in Europe to commit acts of vandalism and violence against Jewish victims. A central component in the assumption that especially since the beginning of the new millennium, Jews worldwide have faced new trend of anti-Semitism is the role of the left, particularly the European left. Historians and philosophers such as Peter Pulzer, Pierre-André Tagiev, and Alain Finkelkraut emphasized the impact of the extreme language against the state of Israel on the creator, or creation of what Pulzer called anti-Semitic atmosphere. The demonization of Israel, particularly the equation of Israel with Nazi Germany, what I called in one of our general analyses, the Nazification of Israel, this equation, which in the past was confined to Arab and the Soviet propaganda, as well as to the margins of the Western society, the extreme left, penetrated 
to the liberal papers and acquire a respectability. Okay. Let's see just two examples. Okay. This first one, the two examples is from a Norwegian, Norwegian mainstream papers and they both are using elements from classic anti-Semitism, the demonization of the Jew and the dehumanization of the Jew. And this first one is from a very well-known um, picture. Um, this is from the Schindler List, if you remember. Emil Gott, uh, the commander of the Plaschow concentration camp, standing on his balcony and shooting children. And this is now, of course, Eud Ulmiot on his balcony, shooting Palestinian children. So this is one example of the demonization of Israel and the using of Nazi symbols against Israel. And this is another example, the dehumanization of the Jews. You can see a Olmert as a beast. So these are just two examples of demonization and dehumanization of the Jews in numerous um, mainstream uh, publications. Tagiev claims that the extreme anti-Israeli propaganda encourages and even incites to commit violent incidents against Jewish targets. In this respect, the reference made by Lauren Summer, the former president of Harvard, to actions that are anti-Semitic in their effect, if not in their intent, particularly when accusing Israel of using Nazi methods against the Palestinians, including mass killing, in order to carry out ethnic cleansing, is very important. <coughs> Finkelkraut, Pulzer, and others emphasizes that as an outcome of this extreme anti-Israeli attitude and this deep empathy with the Palestinians, there are those on the left who tend to tolerate extreme deeds that are being perpetrated by the allegedly victims, namely the Arabs and the Muslims who suffered from discriminations both in Israel and in Europe. Finkelkraut, a, a Finkelkraut explains that the left in Europe defends those whom he defines as the victims of the victims. The Palestinians and Muslims in Europe, according to Finkelkraut, replace the Jews as the new persecuted minority. They are, according to Finkelkraut, the new other. The Jew used, and I quote, the Jew used to be the other, but now the Jews have an other of their own. The true Jew is the real Jew's other, meaning the Palestinian, the Muslim. He is the other now in Europe. Pulitzer writes that according to the pro-Palestinian left, if anti-Semitism is not the fault of the far right, then its perpetrators should be pitied rather than condemned. They are not the heirs of Vichy. Now, Based on the main, main arguments that we analyzed so far, of those who support the assumption that particularly since the end of 2001, the manifestations of Jewish hatred grow dramatically, we can define the term new anti-Semitism as direct 
identification between Jewish communities and individuals in Israel which perceived Israel and the Jews as a single evil entity. According to this concept, any Jew, whatever his views on Israel, should be held responsible and should pay for Israel deeds, or even for Israel <coughs> existence. Thus, anti-Semitism became interchangeable with anti-Zionism. And the word Zionist is identified with the Jew. Three groups play a major role in the various manifestations of this new anti-Semitism. The Islamists, who perceived Israel as an advanced post of the West, of the Western world and the world uh, and, the, and the worldwide uh, jury. This is the first group. The second, young Muslims who are incited by the extreme anti-Israeli propaganda and the anti-Semitic messages, both in the Arab and the Muslim uh, media and the European media to commit violence and vandalism acts against Jewish sites and Jewish individuals. And at least part of the European left, who on the one hand contribute considerably to the demonization of Israel, occasionally by explicit or implicit anti-Semitic symbols, Few researchers such as Carmon, Graciela Bendro, Dina Porat, David Hirsch, and others emphasize also the anti imperialism, the anti globalizations, and the anti American sentiments as central to the extreme anti Israel feelings, which are frequently directed against the Jewish communities and Jewish organizations as an allegedly automatic supporters of Israel. This has been noticeable in recent years, this concept, the connection between anti-Americanism and anti-Semitism, in the extreme statements of President Hugo Chavez and higher, um, his higher uh, echelons of his administration. From here, I would like to move on to the other camp, to those who object the assumptions that particularly since 2001, anti-Semitism grow dramatically. The members of this group are mainly Jewish leftists or liberals as they prefer to define themselves who are very critical regarding Israel's basic stance and regarding the Jewish establishment that support Israel. While those, this, this group um, doesn't actually deny the events themselves, both the violence against the Jews and the extreme anti-Israel propaganda, their interpretation about the essence of these events is completely different from the argument that I presented so far. <laughs> there is a complete disagreement between these two camps regarding the question of continuity and change. The events and the manifestations that were defined as new anti-Semitism are explained by them as a continuation and or as an aggravation of previous anti-Israel and anti-Zionist manifestations. 
While Kramer and Carmon, whom I mentioned, pointed out that the innovation in the Muslim fundamentalist concept is this worldwide jihad against the Jews, Brian Kluck, for example, rejected the claim that there has been, and I quote, a global war against the Jews. Klug, a senior research fellow in philosophy in Oxford, is also the co-founder of the Independent Jewish Voice, a group of British Jewish liberals who aim to create alternative Jewish voice to the official leader leadership of the Jewish community in Britain. And according to them, like all Jewish communities in other countries who automatically support Israel. And I quote from their mission statement, they, the Jewish communities or the Jewish organizations, they support for the policies of an occupying power above the human rights of an occupied people. Klux sees the terror attack against Jewish targets perpetrated by Muslims, as well as the violent incidents perpetrated by young Muslims, as a retaliation against Israel, namely a continuation of the terror attack of the, um, of the Palestinians from the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. The Jews are forced to pay, according to him, for Israel deeds. Even the war against Israel, waged by the Islamic terrorist groups, is not, according to Klug, a war against Israel as a Jewish state, but rather as a European an interloper or as an American client or as a non-Arab, a non-Muslim entity. Moreover, as an oppressive occupying force. According to this view, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the only reason for the violent incidents against the Jews in Europe. Similarly, Tony Lerman claims that as opposed to the anti-Semitism in the past, the hostility to Jews is grounded today in the real political situation. It can increase and decrease according to the events. The undeniable fact that the Jews became target of Muslim rage seems to Klug almost reasonable in the light of Israel's basic concept repeatedly stated by its leaders that Israel is a Jewish collective. The sovereign state of the Jewish people as a whole in the light of the fact and also in the light of the fact the Jews gathered in large numbers in numerous cities to demonstrate their solidarity. So it is clear, clear why, the, why, why the Muslims attacked them. Blaming, actually, Israel for pretending to be the embodiment of the Jewish people and the tendency of Jewish communities and Jewish organizations to support Israel almost automatically is the repeated claim in various essays that reject the idea of the new anti-Semitism. It seems that Tony Jutt, a professor of European studies in NYU, expressed 
this concept in the most blatant way. And I quote, Israel's leaders claim to speak for the Jews everywhere. They can hardly be surprised when their own behavior provoke a backlash against the Jews. So Israel and the Jewish communities are responsible for the attacks against the Jews. Not only that Israel's policy is actually the reason for the violence against the Jews, according to Jude, this is this outcome, this is an outcome of which many Israeli politicians are far from being unhappy. So they are happy about the increase of anti-Semitism worldwide because they can utilize it to silence criticism against Israel by defining any criticism as anti-Semitism. Now, the question regarding the linkage between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, namely, is there a conceptual link between them? Or are we dealing here with two distinct attitudes? Is one of the most disputable issues between those two camps. And there are many articles that were written on the subject, and recently this excellent work of David Hirsch that was published on the site of the Yale Initiative. So I'll mention only briefly that those who support the claim that the Jews are facing new trend of anti-Semitism, they view anti-Zionism as a major component in this trend of the new anti-Semitism. They claim that anti-Zionism, particularly after the establishment of the State of Israel, is identical with anti-Semitism, equating the campaign to delegitimate the existence of the State of Israel with the classic anti-Semitic campaign. To quote Wistrich, for example, already from the beginning of the 80s, anti-Zionism, he said, seeks to de-emancipate the Jews as an independent nation, much as modern secular European anti-Semitism insistently sought to de-emancipate the Jews as a free and equal individuals. Meaning that they both try to undermine the Jewish political achievements. The dissenters, on the other hand, assert that anti-Semitism, which is based on racial and religious hatred, should not be confused with the political opposition to the Zionist idea and to the existence of the State of Israel. Moreover, they claim that since the establishment of the Zionist movement, anti-Zionism anti has been always part of the internal Jewish debate and has never been labeled as anti-Semitic. Now, my conclusions. I would like uh, to relate to three main problems that are central to this debate. My first comment is about the left argument that Islamic attacks on Jews are only a retaliation against Israel. It is indeed almost a consensus that anti-Semitism evolved in the Arab and the Muslim world as a consequence of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And that some of the main motifs of the current anti-Semitism in the Arab world were absorbed from the Europeans. Nevertheless, the claim that Islamist terror attacks 
against Jewish targets is only a retaliation of Israel deeds that the Jews must pay for Israel deeds contradicted both the statement and the deeds of Islamist groups who perceive the Jewish people in general as an evil entity. It seems that in their eyes there is a complete identification between Zionist and Jew. And this was clearly shown, for example, in the terrible murder of Daniel Pearl. My second note is about the young Muslims in Europe. As noted, both sides actually emphasize external factors as the main reasons for the violent incidents against the Jews in Europe, perpetrated in many cases by youth from immigrant families. Those who support the thesis regarding the new anti-Semitism see, they see those attacks as part of the campaign waged by the radical Islam against the Jewish people and the West in general, and stress the influence of the extreme anti-Israel incitement of the left. The other camp, the dissenters, claim that it is the fury of the injustice policy of Israel towards the Palestinians that provoke young Muslims to commit violence. Thus, they claim more positive policy or more balanced attitude of Israel or more balanced attitude of European governments to the conflict would mitigate the violence. As I claimed in an article published in Haaretz, both camps tend to undermine local European social and economical background to the acts of violence against the Jews, as clearly shown in studies both in, in, in Britain, based on findings of the London police and the French in France of the, on the French Interior Ministry. The conclusions of these studies are that the extreme anti-Israeli propaganda that includes anti-Semitic motives comprise only one catalyst for the feelings of hostility that are expressed among other ways in the spontaneous violence against Jews in streets or near synagogues or in schools, <coughs> meaning that even young immigrants who are not extreme Muslims, or maybe not Muslims at all, are involved in the incidents. These findings lead to a very pessimistic feeling about the way that anti-Semitic stereotypes are adopted by immigrants and their children in Europe. And this was clearly shown in the murder of Ilan Halimi in Paris. My last point is about the claim that anti-Zionism is a distinct attitude from anti-Semitism. Since it is not against the Jews as a human beings, but against the political, a political entity, and it has been part of a Jewish this debate between Zionists and anti-Zionists was always part of the internal discourse ever since the, of, in the Jewish people, ever since the Zionist movement was established. While I agree that historically anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism were indeed different attitudes, I believe that this assertion is irrelevant to the anti-Zionist campaign after the establishment of the State of Israel. The aim and the motivation of the current anti-Zionists differs from those of the German Jewish liberals at the end of the 19th century 
or members of the Bund in Eastern Europe, or even Jews in the communist parties. German Jewish liberals sought to improve the legal status of the Jews. Members of the Bund and the Jewish communist parties felt that Zionism and Palestine could not be the answers to the miseries of the Jewish people, and only revolution was the real cure. However, today in the pluralistic societies of Europe, where Jews are not fighting anymore for civil rights, these confrontations between Zionists and their opponents are irrelevant. And the aim of contemporary anti-Zionism is not to improve the Jewish situation, but to deprive the Jews of their rights and actually to bring about the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state. Per Almark, a former Swedish vice prime minister, and a veteran fighter against anti-Semitism said a couple of years ago, and I quote, that while the old anti-Semitism sought to make the world Judenrein, the new anti-Semitism seeks to make the world Judenstadtrein. Similarly, in his tale of love and darkness, Amos Oz wrote, that when his father was a young boy in Europe, he frequently saw the graffiti, Jews go to Palestine. When he returned to Europe some 50 years later, he found new graffiti, Jews get out of Palestine. Thank you very much for a comprehensive overview of, of the issues of the day. So, we can take some questions. Uh, last year, when my husband and I were in Israel, we had an opportunity to have a meeting with Aryeh O'Sullivan, who's a former writer for the Jerusalem Post and now works for the Anti-Defamation League. Um, I've worked for the League three different times, so I was a colleague of his, and he shared with us a survey that had just been done about uh, the perception of anti-Semitism among school children, particularly high school children in Israel. And the survey showed that high school children perceived that anti-Semitism was something from history, something from World War II. And they appeared to be, according to the survey, completely unaware that it was a contemporary problem. I wonder what your perception is of how aware college youth or graduate students are about the problem of the new anti-Semitism, and then what do you think Israeli society in general thinks of this as a contemporary problem? So, my impression is that the Israeli society really passed a dramatic change in the attitude towards anti-Semitism. Um, that when I began with this, the study of anti-Semitism, we established our institute in Tel Aviv University, as I told Charles. The university itself was really against establishing the institute. It was the beginning of the 90s. The university itself was the bank guest. No one, everyone said, what, you don't need to study anti-Semitism. There is no, nothing like, like that. And anti-Semitism is only perpetrated by extreme right fanatics or neo-Nazis, and who care about them? So this was the, the concept in Israel for many years. And if there is anti-Semitism, Jews should come to Israel. And my impression is that this attitude has changed in the last couple of years. It's changed because now the Israelis, I 
understand that anti-Semitism is against Israel. I mean, that you can't really distinguish between attacking Jews in Europe and attacking Israel. It became, I mean, it became one entity. So this really, I think, made a real change in the attitudes of the Israelis. Maybe we need to wait until we see that, that the impact on, on youth in Israel. But this is my feeling. You can see it from the, now to, of, from the involvement of the government of Israel, for example. Uh, 20 years ago, Israel government didn't do anything about anti-Semitism. Now there are conferences. And now there is a special unit who is collecting information about anti-Semitism. Because anti-Semitism became part of the war against, also the war against Israel. I'm also going to take Ed and then another question, but I'll just put in two cents too. I know in philosophy we discuss about the positionality and the gaze and where, where you see and where you stand. And I, if I can relate your question to the United States, I, I think having come, lived, lived in Israel and come to the United States, that I don't think that the students, and I would even say scholars and the Jewish community in the United States, really understand the profound implications of what's going on in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis anti-Semitism. So I, I, I think is, so I think Israelis uh, unfortunately had a they woke up I think in general as a society, but I think there's a lot of work to do in North America. What just to add one sentence, what I tried to show in the first part of my lecture is that everyone in Israel, including us, as a researchers, if I'm looking back about on the nineties, we were surprised. We didn't really understand the situation. I mean, we didn't really, at that time, we didn't, we also, it, it, it started already uh, during the 90s, but in the 90s, the only thing that we, we dealt with was the extreme right and the neo-Nazis. We didn't really see the real threat. So it takes time. Thanks very much for, for the uh, comprehensive talk. I, I have a slightly different question, which is um, we've had several presentations in our seminar series, which I would say are documentary in nature, documenting anti-Semitism in different locations, documenting histories in different locations, and, and then coming through to the contemporary uh, issues of new anti-Semitism, but again, largely what I would call documentary in nature. My question is more a research question looking forward. If, if you were going to say there was one or two important unanswered questions in the study of anti-Semitism, what would those questions be? What do you think are the most important academic research questions for scholars of anti-Semitism to focus on now? And Charles, actually, I wouldn't mind hearing you chime into it too. We've got two directors of Centers for Anti-Semitism Research here. I want to hear what you think about this. Okay. So one question is the question that I mentioned is the really the attitude of young um, young immigrants in Europe towards the Jews. We can see more and more that from all the reports that we have that it is not only uh, Muslims and Arabs that are um, that, that are part of it, but immigrants from Africa other places that um, really they have something against the Jews which is something that we still need to understand my feeling is and I, I, I'm not of course the, the um, events in the Middle East they of course influence on the level of anti-semitism but my feeling is that there is something more basic that is connected to the situation in Europe and that they absorbed anti-Semitic stereotypes against the local communities without direct connection to the situation in the Middle East or to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And this is something that we really need to investigate. Okay, is, is, is your interest more in 
say, the prevalence of the phenomena, or is it the mechanisms? Like, how is it that this comes about? How is it that new immigrants exactly. come to you? Exactly, exactly. Why, they, why do they observe the anti-Semitic stereotypes? What can we do? I mean, for example, one of the suggestions was more meetings between representatives of Jewish community and representatives of a, a local communities. I mean, not without trying not to speak about the Middle East and about the conflict between the Arab and the Palestinians, but trying more to speak about the relations between Jews and Muslims in Europe. Because there are so many Muslims today in Europe, and this is a fact. So what are we going, what are we going to do about this? I mean, my feeling is that this, the fact that, for example, as I said, Yehuda Bauer and Bistrich, they always mention only the genocidal aspect of anti-Semitism. But my feeling is that this genocidal aspect of anti-Semitism, okay, so this is Bin Laden or other Muslim, Muslim, very extreme Islamist groups. But what about all the young Muslims youth in Europe? I mean, all the findings, that some of the findings I mentioned here, of the London police, of the French interior ministry, they showed that most of the people, most of the young, it's not always young Muslims. They are not Muslims even. But they are perpetrating violence against the Jews. And of course the question is why? And what, we can, what can we do? This is a very important question for the Jewish communities in Europe today. Yes, please. Let me tell you about a problem that I have, and that is understanding why such a large percentage of the intellectual community that is the proponent of, the, of this philosophy happen to be Jews, yes. especially in England, although we have our share here in the United States, but not in such predominant numbers as in England. Mm -hmm. Why is that phenomenon exist? Well, I think that there is, a, there is a, basic, a basic criticism and animosity in the uh, British left, among them Jews against Israel. Um, they see Israel as someone, or as a country, who betrayed the principles of the Jewish people. This is the basic concept of the Jewish leftists. That Israel betrayed the humanistic, the anti-nationalist concepts of the Jewish people. But this is kind of a very deep animosity against Israel. Most of those intellectuals are against nationalism, uh, with the cosmopolitan concept. So, so they are really, a really integral part of this camp. They, they, all, they, 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 they are the leaders of this camp. They see the attack of Israel as part of the attack of nationalism today. The concept is post-nationalism. Israel rep represents for them, I mean, the main nationalist country today, the chauvinist country, which is against, in their opinion, against the principles of the Jewish people. They see themselves, they see themselves as the real, the the the, um, the genuine representatives of the Jewish people. And Israel is a country that betrayed the principles of the Jewish people. This is why there is so much against Israel. Even to the point of supporting is a, another Holocaust against Jews? Well, they don't see it like that. Then they, they don't see it like that. I mean, in their opinion, they, in, their opinion, in, their opinion, in their opinion, in their opinion, the policy, I'm just trying to explain their opinion. In their opinion, the policy of Israel and the government of Israel will bring Holocaust. And also, the main claim which I mentioned is the Jews worldwide pay 
for the deeds of Israel. This is, this is the, the, the main claim. That because, because this concept of Israel, that Israel represents the Jewish people, and Israel is the sovereign entity of the Jewish people, the Jews worldwide, they pay for Israel did, which they are against it. They claim we are against what Israel is doing to the Palestinians in the territories, and eventually we pay for it. So they call upon the Jewish communities, they call upon the Jewish organizations to say very clearly that they don't support Israel policy, or they don't support automatically Israel policy to explain. I mean that we are not like them. So you can. This is also part of the history of anti-Semitism. Just always said, okay, we are not. We are not like them. They are Jews. We are not really like them. So this is a very old. This is a very old claim. This is something that they say today. We are not part of this entity. Don't attack us. We are against them. And they say it very clearly. Israel and the Jewish, if we want to solve the problem of violence against Jews in Europe, we must tell the Arabs and the Muslims that we don't support Israel automatically. There's a follow-up to this. It seems to me that, you know, that that is really the vital point as it relates to the survivability of Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, as you know, you mentioned Tony Jude before. We haven't quite said it in these words, maybe just implied, but he stated openly that he favored that it should be a binational state. Right. And so many of these uh, leftist intellectuals make that statement. Uh, yet, uh, I don't know, I'm, most of us who were very active in, in this believe that that would be the end of Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, so how do we reconcile that? Do they, do they really go that far in their thinking or they just stop? We're not like that. That's it? And, you know, no, keep claiming against it? The claim, well, I, I said it before that in my opinion, I mean, this claim that anti Semitism is something different, uh, anti Zionism is something different from anti Semitism because anti Zionism was always part of the Jewish debate since the Zionist movement was established. I said that this is irrelevant to the situation today because Israel was established and it's a fact. And if you are talking about anti Zionism, actually you are talking about the destruction of the state of Israel. And their claim is that not necessarily. I mean, they relate to this, of course, to this claim that actually they support the destruction of Israel. But their claim is that there are no solutions, like an Israeli-Palestinian state and so on and so forth. So this is, according to them, this is not really the destruction of the state of Israel. Of course, they, they, they can't give any, I mean, any answer to the question what are the Jews in Israel are going to do when our population will be so big and they in Israel and wanted and, and, and will actually rule the state of Israel? They don't have a real answer for that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a um, when we talk about Christian anti-Semitism, people are not reluctant to attribute the sources of the anti-Semitism to the religion itself. However, when we talk about anti-Semitism in the Muslim world, people are much more careful about ascribing it to religious roots. And one reason for that is the supposedly better treatment of the Jews right. over the years in Muslim countries. Right. But it, it seems to me that if you look at the Muslim religious tradition, um, particularly if you look at things like the, the pigs and apes quote that goes around, and, and if you look at um, some of the hadith are, are deeply anti-Semitic, and, um, and if you even look at um, like the Kaibar missile comes from the Battle of Kaibar in the Quran, 
that, that, and Muhammad had some real atrocities against Jews in the Quran, that um, it seems that one idea, is, when you're trying to address this question of the distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, is that it is anti-Semitism, and it has roots in the religion, and the only reason that Jews were treated better over the years was because they were subordinate to Islam. But that the idea of treating the Jews fairly when they are not subordinate to Israel, in other words, when they are an independent state, would be contradictory to, um, to Muslim religious traditions. And therefore, even the anti-Zionistic component is really anti-Semitism, because it reflects a failure to accept the Jews as, as equal or as to be tolerated. I'm wondering if you, if you think that this, this is another angle on this anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism thing, and it's really a, a religiously based phenomenon, at least in part. Basically, I agree with you, but it, it's very interesting that even the, the experts on Islam, like um, Kramer and others, didn't see before the 90s this picture. They didn't see it clearly as you, you present it now. I mean, they knew that there, you can find, of course, in the Quran uh, allegations against the Jews and so on and so but they didn't see it as a real problem. And also the experts on, the, 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 on, on Islam um, always made this distinction between what happened in the Muslim's world and what happened in the Christian world. I mean, the, something I accept this claim that something happened recently. On, it is true that you can find the roots, Sayyid Qutb and others, you can find the roots in Egypt and other places. I mean, it's, you, you can compare it also to the roots of National Socialism. You can find the roots of National Socialism at the end of the 19th century. During, Fritsch, Mao, and so on and so forth. But you, people looked for the roots of National Socialism only because National Socialism became so powerful in Germany. So I mean, without National Socialism as a, as, as a party who became the, nom the dominant party in Germany, people, this is the only reason that people looked, they looked for the roots of modern anti-Semitism at the end of the 19th century. So this is my answer. Only because now we have groups like Bin Laden and others that are really adopted the genocidal concept of anti-Semitism, then we look back to the roots of, okay, we can find, of course, always, you can find always for every ideology, ideology the roots in the past. But it's only because it became such a powerful political fact. Can I ask one quick follow-up? Yes. It's that Hitler, it seems to me, could have created, I, I, I follow your analogy there, but I think Hitler could have created National Socialism without those historical roots, perhaps. He could have done it all at once. He could have maybe made up for that late 19th century development, at least in theory. If you, you can imagine in, in principle that he could have. However, had those roots not been present in the Islamic religious tradition, then Said Qutb and the, um, the people who built on it would not have been able to, um, to, to build on it. There was, in other words, they needed it in their religious tradition in a sense that Hitler did not need it. I don't, I really, I, I don't agree because I think that Hitler, of course, absorbed all the pamphlets and the, the books that you read about modern anti-Semitism, but the point is that it is a fact that until today, or until the beginning of, of the, the last decade, um, although you could find the ideas of, uh, of um, some of the uh, Muslim fundamentalists in Egypt and other countries, it became such a strong and powerful movement only recently. <laughs> so, you should see that the, the, I mean, the political situation or the political context, and then to go back. Even though that it was there always, all, all the time, it wasn't powerful until today. Quick, quick question from Ed, and then 
So it's, it's really just a comment. I, I think the, one of the reasons why things took off so rapidly in the last 10, 15 years, I think unquestionably, is just technology. That is to say, it's possible to reach much larger audiences much more quickly, and a very small number of people have the ability to do that. So people can post videos on the internet, people can put whatever, you know. So, so it, 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 it becomes possible for all of these things to transmit much more rapidly, to reach much greater audiences, and that compresses the time scale. But the and, and, and by the way, it's, it's also sort of consonant, I think, with what you were saying, because any time you're looking for a religion in religion to make the case, it's just so easy to do it. And, you know, so, so which, which actually led to a, a different question I had, which was whether or not we have any reason to believe that, on the whole, Muslims around the world have become more observant, less observant, or if that's just the wrong way to even think of it, and, and it's basically this awareness of uh, sort of these ancient hatreds of Jews, uh, which have come to the service, is in some sense something different. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's orthogonal to observance, but it's just something that receives much more attention than perhaps it used to receive before. I, I understand your point, it, basically what you're saying, is that no one would have looked back at this until you actually saw the incident. And so, and so it's sort of and also that we should, but also that we, we need to see the attacks of the attacks against the Jews worldwide, or seeing the Jews today as an eternal, as an, an evil entity, mm -hmm. is part of the campaign of the Muslims against the United States, against the globalizations, mm -hmm. to see the whole picture. It became so powerful, it was in the past. But it was always there. This is my, my answer. The, the ideas are always there. The question is the, the political situation. It became so powerful today, and we should, the, our, as a researcher, we need to explain why today. It's a little bit like an epidemic phenomenon. I mean, you, you, when, when, when you have transmission of ideas, just like the transmission of infections, basically, you cross a threshold, things take off. And I would argue that the technology has sort of enabled this threshold to be, to be crossed. And I think that fits with the time scale you showed. So, I mean, when you think about when things really started to take off, 20 years ago, we didn't have an internet. We didn't have satellite television. It was much, much more difficult for these ideas to, to move you know, rapidly and to reach large numbers. Of people. Imagine what would have happened with Syed Qutub if he had the internet. Just, we, could, just, we could have had all yes. of this stuff happening long ago. Just, just to say that, for, for example, today, when I'm giving a, a, a course in Israel, Tel Aviv University about modern anti-Semitism. I'm teaching about during and Fritsch and, and, and Mao. Most of the people at the end of the 19th century didn't hear about this, those people at all. They became so important only because of the National Socialism Party. This is the only reason. No one heard about this Katub before Bin Laden or the, the, I mean most of the Muslims, most of the Arabs. It became so powerful because of the political situation today. People are looking back mm -hmm. to his ideas. This is a, this is my in my opinion. Yeah, I just want to bring something up to date that's happening in the United States from an Israeli perspective and also from your perspective. Also, I never, uh, as a person that is involved with Yale University educate, I never could intellectually understand where black American anti-Semitism arose from. It's more than the internet. And of course it comes now, we have a candidate for a president, and I don't understand where this black theology is coming from. I mean, he, he mentions rails against Americans, this minister. He's not the only minister. He rails against Jews. He doesn't rail against the Chinese who are taking over consumerism. He doesn't rail against the Hispanics who are taking all the jobs from the black people. I mean, think of all the people he can rail against. You know, I understand in the prisons why a certain population of black Americans are being converted to Islam because it's an aggressive, forceful religion. But how do you, how, this is a Christian minister. So why is he picking on the Jews? What about all the other people? No, he never said anything about Jews. Reverend Wright never singles out Jews. He made some comments about Israel, but never about Jews. And it's largely about his experience with South Africa. It's conditioned by his working against South African apartheid, 
and uh, Israel's unfortunate support for the South African apartheid regime. Jews, not a single comment, sorry. Find me one comment where he mentions Jews. How about Zionists? He had anti-Zionist comments. <coughs> it's all about Israel. Yes, he has comments Zionism. about Israel, not about Jews. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make a subtle distinction here. You know, you, you can say you're not interested in nuance or subtlety, but I'm just, I'm just making that distinction. Did, were you here for the whole program? Here, were you here for the last hour? I am addressing your comments. Yeah, no, but he mentioned I am addressing Zionism. Don't fight, don't fight. But he mentioned it before. I'm not here for debate, I think. In this case, it's both. So we have the question, we got the point of clarification. Do right. you want to comment? Um, <laughs> I'm not really so expert about, uh, about this. <coughs> the I, ideas I of this. Uh, uh, okay. Maybe you can. You want to cut? Yeah, okay, we'll have another may question. I have a question. <laughs> the Jews are a minority in the world. Do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. And within the world, the Jews are to have a diversity that goes back many, many years. Right. The sample of the Jews, and the Jews, we have Israel, and we have the diaspora, and we have all the other nuances of different races and everything else. So we are a very, very small sample in the whole population. So it appears that the problem really is ours. Why do I say that? Because we have to decide how we can conform with minimally changing our diversity to the rest of the world. So what should we do? I'll tell you. What do we do? That's the fair. I've been talking to people and I find if, now if, if you don't we are changing. We are I'm, changing. I'm going to interrupt, but you can just focus well, on the What question. you do is tell, tell, us what, tell us what we're willing to give, give up for the first to, to identify ourselves to the rest of the world that we are not intolerant. Like what? Like, we in the United States have conscientious objectives when we, when we uh, had our world in what to, and conscientious objectives went out. Israel has that problem too. We have it between our orthodox and our conservative and our secular, right? I understand now, from what I've heard, that in Israel, if you do not serve in the army or in the military, you cannot get the, a top position. But now, these are the orthodox, and I don't know which levels of orthodoxism is that, are serving because they want to participate. At one time, we've had the problem since 48, if you want to go back, we've had it earlier, we've had the problem between Zionism and, and uh, religion. We have the problem with government, separation of, of religion and state. So there's a give there. Because when I was in Israel in 68, and I was in, in the I'm yeah, sorry. I, they I'm, went not, to, I'm just trying to give you a picture yeah. of a different What's the question, please? Now, what's the solution? The question. What's the your question? The question is, how can Israel resolve <coughs> their problem and we can help when, there, when you have people that are in diaspora with Derek Eretz, you have people that are in Israel that are fighting for, for survival, how, how, can, how can we solve that problem? And we, I think we are, to some degree, but uh, I'm just trying to give you a different perspective. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I don't know how to solve these problems. It's nothing to do with this. No, I'm not ready to do well, it. I think Ronnie answered. Ronnie answered because he doesn't know the American context. Well, that was his answer.